Well, good morning to all of you. Let's try it again. Good morning. Oh, all right, I like it. That's great. That's great. Um, one of the joys of preaching here at Southside is you become the recipient of much prayers, and let alone the privilege of picking all your favorite songs. So there's a bit of selfishness of that, but uh, I hope and I pray uh, that I would serve you the word this morning faithfully and accurately. I want to invite you this morning, please, if you would, take your Bibles and turn with me to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, and looking at verses 38 to 42. And as you're turning there, um, recently I read an article that posed life's priority question in a book by Stephen Covey, First Things First. This is a very, very penetrating question to all of us, and it hit my core in a good way. This question goes like this. What is the one activity, the one activity that you know, if you did superbly well and consistently, would have a significant positive result in your life that would eventually affect everything you do? What is the one activity in your life that would affect everything. We, here in Luke 10, we're going to look at a narrative. We find ourselves between the thundering mountains of Malachi and the glorious peak of Romans 12 that beckons, hopefully next week, we find ourselves in a little village called Bethany, two miles east of Jerusalem, where we see Christ visiting a home that he loved, two sisters, and he's coming over for dinner. In this short five-verse narrative, is not very theological, if you will, but it is very practical for most of us. This is probably one of the only few places we will find Christ closely involved and tied into a domestic life of a family. Let me read it for us. Many of you are familiar with it. Now, as they were traveling along, he entered a village, and a woman named Nartha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part which shall not be taken away from her. I love drama. I love biblical drama. There's lots of it here. Over the centuries, this story in church history of the two sisters has, has modeled the two types of people, two personalities, two temperaments, if you will. It's been wrongly allegorized as the quietism of Mary and the activism of Martha. It's been often called the clash of two temperaments. On the one side, you have Martha, the dry, overactive religious life, the doers, the achievers, the religious dynamos, if you will. They're about commands and obedience. They're about service, service, service. They're about the effective life is the active life. They're the religious G.I. Joes, if you will. 
they're here with this, ready to save the world. They, they have this savior complex. Then on the other side, you have the Marthas, I'm sorry, the Marys, the contemplative life, the receptive life, the meditative life, always sitting in, listening, hopping from Bible study to Bible study, taking it all in, soaking it all in. We call those spongy Christians. Just, just give it to me. Give it to me. Soaking it all in. In the, mid, in the medieval days, the monastic life was born out of this movement. Even though it is true, even though it is true, there are two personalities and there are two temperaments. This story is not about the different personalities and temperaments. There's so much that goes into that. There's a story I, I told, I think, the young disciples it's actually a story about Martha and Mary. It's a story of a, a seminary professor who would every Sunday night bring his students in and they would read a text and he would, and he would ask them theological, biblical questions. And one day they read Luke 10.38, Martha and Mary, and he said, Men, in all seriousness, if you had the option to, bury, to marry a Martha or a Mary, who would you marry? The guys were all quiet. Is this a biblical question? Is this a theological question? What, what kind of question is this? After five minutes of silence, this young, wide-eyed seminary student said, Sir, I'd like to marry Martha before dinner and Mary after dinner. <laughs> If your husband just laughed at this joke, elbow him, but <laughs> let, me, let me pray for us. Let me pray for us before this goes south really fast. <laughs> Father, um, here we are under your word, under your sovereignty, under your rule. Father, your family, brothers and sisters, Lord, your bride, your body is gathered together to look to you, our shepherd and our Lord. Father, would you please come to us this morning in your word? Father, would you come to us in your spirit and by your spirit? Would you please fill our hearts with sweet adoration? Would you please confront our hearts and would you please renew, restore, and keep our hearts always, Lord, always in and by your presence and in and by your word this morning. So please, Lord, give much grace, give much grace this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a sermon. This is a message. This is a story. Really, it's more about keeping the heart keeping the heart. Let me propose for us that the effective life and the receptive life are but one. They're not against each other. There is a time to go and time to do, and there is a time to sit still and to listen and to receive. Just one verse earlier before this passage, Jesus tells the, the religious people, he says, go and do the same. Earlier in my life, there is a book that I've often went to called Keeping the Heart. was written in the 1600s. It is really about the issues that overtake the heart. And it's based on Proverbs 4.21, guard your heart with all diligence and out of it flows or springs the issues of life. Get your heart right, get everything right. So come with me this morning as we look at verses 38 and 39. 
We begin at the stopover at the village here. Bethany, again, two miles east of Jerusalem. And as they were traveling along, he entered the village, being Christ. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's table, listening at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. This family of three siblings... Lazarus is not mentioned here, but it's Martha and Mary is most likely with no parents. They live together. They take care of each other. They loved Christ. They, they believed in Christ. They had received his grace. They were faithful disciples. Christ loved being there. Often he made his way to Bethany on the way to and from Jerusalem. He found a haven in their home being nearby Jerusalem, and from other accounts in John 11 and 12, he is often frequenting their living room and their home. In verse 38, we're introduced to Martha, most likely the older sister who was in charge. Luke indicates it's her home, so that means she would have been the mistress of the house, if you will. Martha is an amazing woman. Martha is one of those ladies that would tell you exactly how it is. Type A, double A type of personality. And there is nothing wrong with that. She wants to comfort the Lord with her homemade meal. She wants to honor him. She wants to do what is right. She takes her duties and her responsibility very serious. She's a worker at home. She's hospitable. She swings open her heart. She swings open her home. In John 18, 12, as David read, she is hosting upward of 16 people. In verse 38, it says she welcomed him. The Greek there is, is a beautiful picture. Is it conveys the idea of receiving a guest under your roof, receiving a guest under your care. It's almost as you're putting your hands out to receive someone. This isn't just, hey, come over for dinner, Jesus. This is caring for your guests and bringing them in. So it's a loaded word as, as she welcomes him into the care of their home. Being in the middle voice, it indicates that she did this herself. She initiated the invitation of Christ into her home. And at this point, we don't know if the disciples were with Christ. We don't know if he was there alone. And if they were with Christ, the disciples were with Christ. She and her sister would have been preparing dinner for up to 15 men at this point. where the whole meal would have been prepared freshly that same exact day. So the hustle and the bustle of the home and the kitchen was well underway. Verse 39, there is this scene with Mary. In the Greek, literally, she seated herself at the Lord's feet. All relaxed, taking it all in, all content, listening to his word, of course, with the rest of the guys, which is unheard of in that day, but Jesus Christ welcomes her on an equal level with the other men. And then the rumbling of verse 40 comes about. Notice verse 40 starts with this, but Martha, but Martha was distracted with, and notice, underscore this, all her preparations. She owned it all. The cares, the shopping, all the ingredients, the meal, the soup, the vegetables, the side dishes, the main dishes, the drink, the serving. It was all hers to own. That evening and the meal and the preparation a few hours later began to own her. Somewhere after and somewhere and sometime her cross, her heart crossed the line. The verb distracted is in the passive. She allowed herself, she allowed her heart to be overtaken, if you will, by all the duties and the preparation of that day. She was overtaken, overwhelmed. There was just too much 
It was just too much. This was the restless heart of the night here. In verse 40 comes this outburst. It says, and she came up, stepped up, literally bursted up to him, to Christ, and said, Lord, do you not care? Stop right there. Not so much a question as much as a correction. Lord, do you not care? Are you seeing this? Are you approving of this, that my sister properly belongs in the kitchen with me? Are you going to, are you going to, Sit there and do nothing? Drawing, drawing Christ into her own restlessness. How often we do that. Life gets hard. Our heart gets restless. We leave peace. We, nothing there. And we draw God into our own restlessness. How many of us have done this? How dare we, in times of high anxiety and emotions, we think we can outcare and outlove God, and we begin to question Him. You're going to do something? Do you not care? Don't you love me? And the demands we put on Him, rather than entering His presence, we make Him we ask of him to enter our restlessness, our anxieties. Verse 40 again. Here comes accusations. That my sister, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? First is the accusation of others. Here is her own beloved sister. And usually the closest one to you gets the brunt of all this. Then comes the self-victimization. She left me to do all the serving alone. I'm pulling the weight of this night all by myself. I'm the one that's providing. I'm the one that's doing. I'm the one that's caring. Whatever, whatever it might be. There's this, you leave the covenant type of attitude to a contractual we do this in our marriages. She views now her sister with contempt, judges her for lack of love and help, and also she complains and this entitlement for help. Then tell her, then tell her to help me. Now she's commanding and managing the Lord. All of a sudden, Martha feels isolated in her work from the rest of the household. It's her versus the rest. It's her versus her sister. It's her versus the, the, the company. It's her versus Christ now. How could something start so good end up so wrong? What happened to sweet servant hospitable Martha. Within hours, she went from being Martha the steward to being the stewing Martha. What happened? What happens to us? Her world seems to be unraveling. Here's what's interesting. While the prince of heaven was in the next room. All these are echoes and symptoms of an overwhelmed, distracted, preoccupied heart. This was a spiritual heart attack. Anger, bitterness, resentment, frustration, all the passions and all the emotions were signs revealing her heart was in a bad place. This isn't about serving anymore. We say her mouth, her emotions have become the bucket of her heart. The bucket of her heart. In counseling, 
Emotions are supposed to reveal, not rule. They're not supposed to take over and hijack our hearts. They are the reflections where your heart is at. They are the reflection. Nobody starts out that way in the morning, but it happens. The best of men are men at best. We need to rescue Martha. This is what happens to us. We be, when we become Christians, the heart doesn't stop being deceitful above all and desperately wicked above all. Fallen, sinful, deceptive emotions, when they are in full swing, they blur spiritual reality. Get that? They blur us. We lose our equal spiritual, emotional equilibrium. John Calvin says this on the heart. The human heart has so many crannies where vanity hides, so many holes where falsehood lurks, so decked out with deceiving hypocrisy that it often dupes itself. Who knows? Wonder what Martha did that morning. Maybe Martha woke up that morning praying Psalm 3, the morning prayer. I lay down and I slept. I woke for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people who have set themselves against me around and about. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. What if she got up and prayed that and spent time in the Word that morning? The question we have to ask her and ask us, how do we allow the heart to be smothered with the cares of the issue? How do we read the heart? That day, little by little, the slow, the slow burn burdened her heart. The weight the responsibility, the must-have, the must-dos, the best of everything needs to be perfect. It needs to be just right. It needs to be the latest and the greatest. Her enemy wasn't the 10,000 on the outside. Her enemy was the 10,000 things on the inside. While busy about him, we can't even find our rest in him. So here comes the correction. Christ doesn't leave her there. Here comes the correction. Through, through this narrative, there are three conditions that Luke and the Lord point out to us. Okay? Three words. A distracted heart, a worried or an anxious heart, and a troubled soul. I hope you see the progression of that. A distracted heart, a worried heart, and a troubled soul. Verse 40, we encountered the distraction of the heart. But Martha was distracted with all her preparation. Martha seemed to be overwhelmed with this distraction. The word distracted here is to be cumbered, to, be, to allow your heart, to allow your mind to be dragged around here and there, back and forth, to be pulled apart by these scattered anxieties if you will. It's like a mop back and forth. One anxious thought after another. One worry after another. That's, that's what it means to be distracted. Being in the middle voice, she allowed her heart to go there. She allowed her heart to go there. And not only that, some even indicate that the word could imply that she made more of the problem and the issue than it really is. Living in the stress of it, living in the drama, living in the emotions, living in the moment of it. I'm busy, 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 stressed out. Oh, I can't take this. There's just so many people, so much busy, busy, busy. All this stuff, I got to do this, I got to do that. Just overwhelmed her heart. Sometimes, one man put it, is making too much of our service and of our doing. It's living on serving. It's what you can do, what you could control, what you can accomplish to us men, 
where we compete and strive and earn and win, finding our identity in all this. Earlier in Luke 10, the 70 are sent out. The 70 are sent out and and they came back rejoicing and saying, Lord, quote, even the demons are subject to us in your name. They were given power and authority over all the spiritual world. Lord, look what we have done. And Jesus corrects them and says, look what God has done. Your names, don't rejoice in this. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Rejoice in your election. Rejoice in the love of God. Not that the spirit world is submissive to you. Don't live on what you do and what you accomplish. Live on who you are in Christ. This is important. Martha's problem is in the story is not she wanted to serve Christ never rebukes her for serving or even stops her from serving, but the duty and the serving took over and captured her heart. Hosting and preparing for the Son of God, dinner was one of the most noble service anybody can ever do. And you're not even entertaining angels at this point. You're entertaining the Son of God. How important was this? And how bad and how sideways did it go? Making much, making much of our busyness. Busyness and muchness is as much a mind set and a heart sickness. Listen to this. Kevin DeYoung says, Jesus didn't do it all. Jesus didn't meet every need. He left people waiting in line to be healed. He left one town to preach to another. He hid away to pray. He got tired. He never interacted with the vast majority of people on the planet. He spent 30 years in training and only three years in ministry. He did not try to do it all, and yet he did everything God asked him to do. Jesus was never was never busy, but never in a way that made him frantic, anxious, irritable, proud, envious, distracted by the lesser things. MacArthur hits this on the head also. Listen to this, what what distractions do to our hearts. The weight of so many responsibility and distraction, even worthwhile ones, has a crushing effect on our person's relationship with Christ. It ruins our taste for spiritual things. It suppresses our exuberance of spiritual service. It suffocates our passion for pursuing Christ and intimate relations he offers. It grinds, it grinds away at our soul. Eventually, following Jesus starts to lose its luster. The blessings and the joy of walking with him are crowded out by myriads, tiny details of life. Something, someone took over our hearts. Soren Kierkegaard, one of my favorite writers, he says, the result of business is that An individual is very seldom permitted to form a heart in the midst of busyness, let alone a heart for Christ. The result of busyness is that an individual is very seldom permitted to form a heart. Accusations, self-pity, self-entitlement, Commanding Christ to do something about it, her heart left her restless, distracted, undone, and disgruntled. Which might have just ruined dinner that night. Before we look at how Christ responds to her, I think there's something here for us, specifically men, of what Christ does not do to her. Number one is a great application. 
He did not rebuke her and say, come on, Martha, hold it together. He does not say, here you go again. Get over it, Martha. Martha, you're embarrassing yourself. He doesn't do that. Nor does he try to fix the problem on the outside. Mary, get up, help your sister. Nor does he demean her and say, why can't you be like your sister, Mary? He doesn't do any of that. He doesn't compare her. The Lord reveals her troubled heart. He goes to the sin beneath the sin. He goes to the heart beneath the buckets of our mouth, of our emotions. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, like a good shepherd, he doubles down on her name in love in the most intense, tender way. It's almost to say, Martha, look at me. Martha, stop. Martha, stop. Martha, look at me. Look at me. Give me your heart. And sometimes in the midst of our stress and anxiety, here and there, our brain, our heart is mopped around everywhere like a mop. We don't take the moment to stop. And the Lord is saying to us, Ray, Ray, stop. It's, it's, it's almost to command her into this holy hush. Truth and grace is on display. She feels safe with him, his gentleness, his tenderness in the utmost sense. But notice there's this accusative, there's truth, and yet there's grace here. He says, Martha, Martha, you're worried and you're bothered about, you're agitated about so many things. Do you see what he's doing? He's going right to the source of her distraction. He's going right to the agitated and worried heart. The heart is mentioned 981 times in scriptures. It is called the inner life of every person. It captures the unity and the complexity of our very being. It's the command center. It's our comprehensive core. It's, it's with it, with it we we. With our heart we feel, with our heart we hear, with our heart we speak, with our heart we think, with our heart we act, with our heart we will. So the heart is the very core of this. That's why keeping the heart is most essential to us. And so the Lord goes right to that. When it comes to anger and resentment, and bitterness, and lust, and gossip, and slander. We, we say this, we say, a man never falls on the outside before he falls on the inside. And Martha fell on the inside, and we all fall on the inside. Somewhere between all her preparations in verse 40, and the so many things, she began to lose it. Distracted anxieties led her to an outward agitation. Modern day Martha, she could have been passive aggressive, gave, him, gave the Lord the silent treatment, gave Mary the silent treatment, don't talk to me, leave me alone. She could have said all these things, had done these things. Her hospitality and her delight had become drudgery. We all have these seasons, we all do. Worry. We're weary, disillusioned, discouraged, disappointed. Your relation with God feels distant. Your love for the word has grown cold. How many times I've walked up here and and, and taught Sunday school and I prayed as I was walking up, Lord, I feel like an empty, cracked, dry, distracted vessel this morning. Would you please come? Would you please fill? And would you please help? We all have those days. Life's duties and life's affair don't line themselves up in perfect order. So read your heart. Read your heart. Study your heart. Know when your heart is 
is in a bad place. Don't just live with it. Don't domesticate your emotions. Don't, don't normalize your anger and your resentment and your bitterness. Confess it. Take it to the Lord. A distracted heart that led to distracted anxiety that led to emotional and verbal outburst. Martha needs to be rescued from herself. Martha needs to be rescued. We need to be rescued. And Christ, here is the remedy. Return, Jesus tells her, return for the one thing. Return for the one thing, Martha. Return. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha. Here's verse 32, the remedy. But only one thing is necessary. Only one thing The supreme necessity of your heart is that one thing. This isn't about tables. This isn't about dishes anymore. This isn't about the meal. It's your heart. It's the one thing, the priority. This is about the spiritual nourishment of your heart, not your bodies. This is, as Augustine, this is about the spiritual bread of life. What Martha needed and what we need in our heart is that one thing. Psalm 86, 11, one of my favorite passages. Unite, unite my heart that I may fear, reverence your name. In other words, please, Lord, give me one heart. Give me an undivided heart that I may reverence you and respect you. Here's some applications for us this morning. When we serve in the body of Christ, many of us serve here. To be fed and nourished and satisfied with Christ is more important than to be occupied for Christ. To be nourished and satisfied with Christ is more important than your ministry here at Southside. Remember the faithful church at Ephesus? I know your deeds, I know your toil, I know your perseverance, I know your endurance, I know your purity, I know your doctrine. You lost your heart. You lost your first love in the midst of these things. One thing I learned at 58 years old, sad to say, confession, contentment in Christ trumps achievement for Christ. Contentment in Christ trumps achievement for Christ. Another thing that messes with us is our addiction to these things. Our addiction, the anxiety and the worry they bring. Mental distraction is as much of an addiction as a drug Please own it. Don't let it own you. Own your phone. Don't let your phone own you. Steve Bateman says in an article, Our a- ours is an age of algorithm flattery. They're designed to capture our attention for um, the maximum time to exert the maximum influence over our decisions. Things that make us feel Angry, afraid, aroused, adored. They're designed to manipulate our attention and affection. And somehow we're left for TikTok and Google to Google our way through life. How prophetic this book. Sent to John Flavel. 1600, written in the 1600s. How applicable. He says... Though the world is in your hands, let it not jostle. I had to look up that word. Literally, to push, shove, or crowd Christ out of your heart. The world is in your hand. Don't let it jostle Christ out of your heart. For some of us who make too much of work, duty, job, position, calling, Flavel says, take heed, Christian, lest your shop, wherever that might be, steal away your heart from your closet. Spiritual food and spiritual feedings takes priority over our physical. 
Martha, one thing is necessary. And I love this one commentator. I think it was Philip Ryken. His, he points out that the remedy of Christ to Martha, rather than giving Martha a proposition on the one thing, instead he shows us a picture. And Jesus is telling Martha, 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 Mary has chosen the better portion, the good portion. Mary has chosen. He, he gives Mary as a picture to Martha and to us. And that's what keeps our heart full. It's what keeps our heart full. For, for Mary has chosen the good part, which shall never be taken away. In other words, modern-day translation, while Martha was preparing a banquet, Mary was having one. Mary was having a banquet at the feet of Christ. Mary seated herself. I want to talk about, I want to talk about Mary for a moment. Earlier in the story, when Christ came in, the Greek, it says, Mary seated herself at, feet, at the feet of Christ, listening to him. Notice Christ does not say Mary chose better, but Mary chosen the good portion. Not the better portion, but the good portion. The good portion in the Greek, Merida, is literally, was, she was feeding on the bread of life. There's more to the picture, Mary sitting at the feet of Christ, it's about the posture of her heart. There is, Mary is an amazing woman for us. Every time we find her, she's mentioned three times in scriptures. Here, in John, 1, in John 11, she kneels at Christ's feet and weeps. And in John 12, she prepares his feet. She either is a disciple, she moans at his feet, and she serves him for his burial. Every time somebody said Mary graduated from the college of the feet, that's, that's the posture of her heart, not just her body. She's with Christ constantly. When Mary sits at the feet of Christ, she is sitting at the feet of God, her maker, her creator, her savior. She has chosen the good portion. And let me ask us a question, and this is a way of exhortation. What other place and what other duty would compete with that posture? What other place and duty in our life? Some of us who are in trials. Psalm 27. Paul, the one thing he said you need when these trials and troubles and testing are pressing in. Psalm 27, David got this. When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, though a host encamp against me, though war rises against me, all surround me, no place to escape, Verse 4, he says, One thing I have asked of the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Why? That I may behold the beauty of the Lord and that I may meditate in his temple. The choice of the one thing that shall not be taken away. Brothers and sisters, we... Stand at the door of eternity. Some of us are closer than others. Our jobs will be taken away. Our family will be taken away. Our identity here will be taken away. Everything that seems meaningful here on earth will be taken away. Even ministry. Even serving God. But what will not be taken away is the presence and the words of Jesus Christ as we enter and we come into eternity with him. The choice of the one thing 
fellowship and communion with Christ. Don't lose your heart for your duties. Don't lose your heart for your ministry. Don't lose your heart for your jobs. Don't lose your heart with Christ for your families. When you aim at heaven, here's C.S. Lewis, you get earth thrown in with it. And when you aim at earth, you lose both heaven and earth. In, in this book, and we had it printed on your bulletin, this is probably in my 25, 30 years of a Christian outside the Bible, this is probably the most important paragraph I have ever read. And I come back to it year after year. If you, get, if you don't get anything out of this message, get this one paragraph. Listen to this about keeping the heart. Ecstasy and delight are essential to the believer's soul and they promote sanctification. We were not meant to live without a spiritual exhilaration. And the, and the Christian who goes for a long time without the experience of heart warming will soon find himself tempted to have his emotions satisfied from earthly things and not as he ought. From the Spirit of God, the soul is so constituted that it craves fulfillment from things outside and will embrace earthly joys for satisfaction. When it cannot reach spiritual ones, the believer is in a spiritual danger if he allows himself to go for any length of time without tasting the love of Christ and savoring the felt comfort of a Savior's presence. When Christ, this is important, when Christ ceases to fill the heart with satisfaction, our souls will go in a silent search for other lovers. By the enjoyment of the love of Christ in the heart of a believer, we mean an experience of the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us because the Lord has made him, himself accessible to us in the means of grace. It is our duty and privilege to seek this experience from him in these means till we are made joyful partakers. In other words, next time you feel distracted, dry, emotional, get yourself by the means of grace under the waterfall of his grace and, and read and read Christ. As you read the word, read Christ into your heart. The one thing, read Christ into your heart. While most of the disciples missed the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, these two ladies from sitting and having Christ at his home, Martha in John 11 confessed the, the reality of the resurrection and Mary understood the burial and the death of Jesus Christ and anointed his feet. Serve, serve with all your heart. Serve your heart out, but serve out of the fullness, not the emptiness of your heart. Serve out of a Christ-filled heart. And don't get all resentful and dutiful and bitter and agitated and anxious and worry. Bring that to the Lord. Amen? The greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God. Notice where he starts, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the life of these two saints. Thank you that they were canonized for our encouragement, that they were canonized to confront every wayward, distracted heart in us, Lord. Father, in times of 
troubles, trials, temptations, you have helped us to keep our hearts, Lord, by keeping it on the one thing and by keeping it on you, Lord. Father, I pray, I pray that you would make each and every believer here, brother and sister, give them the art and the mastery to keep their heart, Lord, to guard it with all diligence that, Lord, that the issues and the stuff of life would flow in the aroma of Christ. We thank you, Lord. We love you, and we want to honor you in all that we do, Father God. In his precious name, amen.